Hello, dear friends and colleagues. I'm uh, truly privileged uh, and I'd like to thank Alcon for giving me the chance to moderate this session, including a highly esteemed panel and international pillars of the refractive surgery. And this is the second uh, meeting uh, under the title of Alcon Expert Cloud. And the title of this session is the, uh, is the link between the dry eye and cataract and refractive surgery. So uh, uh, let me start here. I would like to share my screen just to uh, introduce the speakers. So as you know, this is the title of the session here is the impact of dry eye and dry eye on cataract and refractive surgery. And as you know that there is a, some sort of link between the dry eye and cataract and refractive surgery, about more than 50% of the cataract patients have dry eye symptoms, and more than 77% and 63% have corneal staining and uh, uh, break up time less than five seconds, respectively, at the time of cataract surgery. And regards the uh, uh, myobobian gland dysfunction, uh, it's diagnosed in the majority of the patients or the candidates are going to for the cataract surgery. So this is the importance here between the link with the, of the link between the cataract surgery and refractive surgery on so one side and the dry eye. I do believe that the uh, refractive surgery is one of the most underestimated disease. And at the same time, the cataract and refractive surgery is the most widely performed surgical procedures worldwide. So uh, let me start to introduce the panel here today. Uh, we will start according to the sequence of the event. We will start with Dr. Ala Zawawi from Egypt. He will talk about optimization of the ocular surface in dry eye. And then Dr. Siham Lazrak from Algeria, she will talk about the dry eye, the missing factor in the refractive surgery. And then we'll shift to uh, epithelium by Dr. Madsen Sinjepi. We'll talk about what's below the epithelium. Then uh, uh, Dr. Margaret McDonald, I uh, would like to thank her specifically for being with us uh, among her very busy schedule. She will talk about the link between dry eye and refractive surgery. And then my dear colleague, Mohammed Fakhri from Egypt, who will talk about surface visual correction, wound and nerve healing and impact on dry eye. And, and then uh, Dr. Omar Kermani, thank you very much uh, for such hard time. I know that you have been through a very hard time to catch you up with us. Thank you very much. He will talk about the presbyopic laser, his personal experience. And finally, if I have some time, I will talk about the modified preoperative algorithm for the management of dry eye. So now, Dr. Alay Zawawi, it's yours. Uh, just me, uh, let me ask you this question, please. Suppose that you have uh, an oh, corneal topography. You can see here some sort of irregular astigmatism. And this patient is about 60, me 60 years old male. It's coming from uh, ca coming for uh, cataract surgery, and he's asking for presbyopic uh, correct presbyopia correcting IOLs. And as you can see, the corneal topography shows some sort of irregular astigmatism, and this is the biometry on the right side of the screen. So, would you comment, please, on this uh, on this topography? Yes, actually. Uh... In this case, as we are seeing, there is irregularity of the corneal surface. And uh, you know that presbyopic IOLs are very sensitive to uh, biometry and very sensitive for the net result for the presence of any astigmatism. I would rather postpone this uh, case until I, I, I will have to optimize the ocular surface. I have to treat, most probably, this is a dry eye disease, and I have to treat this case. And astonishingly, maybe after... Uh, treating such a surface, you will find a difference of at least half diopter between, oh yes, uh, you will find a, a difference of half diopter between before and after the, the optimization. Meaning that don't take it easily for presbyopic IOLs. You have to investigate well, you have to look after your patient and if he has dry eye or not. So this case shows clearly that some sort of irregular astigmatism can be, can be misinterpreted by the corneal topography as a regular astigmatism, but not as a dry eye. So it's better to optimize the uh, ocular surface before taking the decision and uh, if this patient is a good candidate for presbyopia correcting lenses or not. So now uh, I will stop sharing the screen. Now, Dr. Alazo, it's all yours right now. So you can uh, share your screen, please, and present your uh, talk. Yes, I will speak about optimization of ocular surface during cataract surgery. 
You know that vision starts with the tear film. Such a tear film with dry eye cannot be suitable for any uh, IOL, especially premium IOLs or even regular IOL. You have to treat this surface well in order to have a proper biometry and to have a proper visual result at the end. Because at the end, all the picture will be sent to the retina and the retina is where the, the vision or uh, the rays are finishing there. Cataract and refractive surgery is one and the same. If you are speaking about cataract nowadays in 2020, which part of the cataract surgery is not refractive? Starting from the tear film, this is the first surface that the light will hit in order to enter into the eye. The tear film is very important for the quality of vision after cataract surgery. IOI calculation. The IOI calculation is very sensitive to dry eye because a difference of half or one diopter and difference in the axis of astigmatism if you are using toric IOL uh, will be found if you are operating on a dry eye. Also, the incision, the viscoelastic, the capsulorexis are all steps and you are trying uh, to be perfect in such a step in order to achieve a perfect surgery uh, from the refractive outcome. The IOL choice also, we have the premium IOLs, we have the toric IOLs, we have the test biopic correction IOL. And finally, the excimer laser enhancements in case where there is uh, a mishap in the biometry. Dry eye, as you have introduced, is likely to, to induce cataract surgery is found among uh, people going for cataract surgery. For dry eye is found among people going for cataract surgery. And cataract surgery is likely to induce dry eye and exacerbate any pre existing dry eye condition in significant portion of the patients. The FACO study, which is a prospective health assessment of cataract uh, patient ocular surface, has uh, ended in tear breakup time more than 60% with very abnormal tear breakup time. Corneal staining in about half the cases and Schirmer scores are very low in a good number of these cases. And the prevalence is increasing due to air pollution, more computer work, and more Facebook and chatting on mobiles, air conditions, contact lens, and also remember in this age group, they are using a lot of drugs, the antihistamine, the beta blockers, antispasmotics, and any other psychotropic drugs are among the, the drugs that induce dryness of the eye. Um, it adversely affects the cataract surgery because it affects the corneal surface. The topography taken before the cataract surgery can be seriously affected as you, you have shown in your uh, first uh, two slides, Ahmed, and the intraocular lens calculation can be affected uh, by this um, is head. Uh, and also at the end, the patient can experience poor outcome if he has a dry eye. Remember uh, always that our, our sake or our hope for finally is to satisfy our patient. Any keratometric error of one diopter will result in one diopter uh, error in the IOL uh, calculation. And this is very sensitive in the premium IOLs. Start by identifying any ocular surface problem before going to cut surgery. You should know as a cataract uh, surgeon the symptoms of dry eye. They are almost, we all know that discomfort, dryness, burning, stinging, foreign body sensation, photophobia, fluctuation of vision are all among the symptoms of this dry eye. Uh, try to examine your patient thoroughly. You have to look for the lead for any telangiectasia, for any erythema. The bony gland dysfunction, the bony gland dysfunction is very important to diagnose because it must be treated well before, um, because it's related to dry eye and must be treated in order uh, treated in order to get rid of this uh, condition. The assessment of the dry eye, I believe uh, my colleagues will speak more about that, but we have to know about the tear breakup time, the staining with fluorescein, and the difference with the staining with lysamine green, which quantify both corneal and conjunctival damage, the Schirmer test for the assessment of the tear volume, volume anterior segment OCT for the assessment of the tears itself, and we have the tear lab for the assessment of the osmolarity and composition of the tear. And this is a breakthrough that will tell us the, the, the quality of the tears in our patient. Also, we have the inflammatory um, markers like the, the MMP9, which because inflammation is part and it is an essential part in the dry eye disease. And we must be, as a cataract surgeon, aware of the treatment of such conditions. Again, you have to look for the blepharitis, either anterior or posterior. You have to look for any staphylococcal infection and to treat it vigorously and uh, very aggressively before any surgery. 
uh, meibomian gland dysfunction must be um, diagnosed and well treated. You must examine your patient well. This protease, protease secretion, this means that this dry eye have to be treated before any surgery. Uh, also, you have to know the severity of grading because uh, the treatment will depend upon the severity of the case. I will not go into details, but you have to know that there is my grade one, two, three, four, and this will go from symptoms without signs, and then the signs will increase till finally we have a very dry eye. You have to know the basis for classification of such a dry eye in order to be able to treat it properly. Treat meibomian gland dysfunction before surgery by commercial lead straps, antibiotic ointments, erythromycin, corticosteroids for persistent inflammation. Because remember always that in dry eye and meibomian gland dysfunction, that is the entity of inflammation and you have to treat it. Also, the con consider the treatment with low dose of doxycycline in such conditions. Treat dry eye disease before surgery. This is very important to start at least two weeks and don't go for surgery except it is clear in order to get proper biometry and proper uh, calculations. Treat any aggravating factor, treat any inflammation using steroids, cyclosporin, nutritional substitutes, ret retain the tears, and there is a lot of other, other measures. Use the analgesic of the ocular surface just before the operation, before the analgesics are usually detrimental to the surface of the cornea. Intraoperative measures, minimize the incision size to reduce the number of cordial nerves cut, avoid limbar relaxing incisions. Limbar relaxing incisions are among the, the most important causes of dry eye after cataract surgery. Intraoperative measures, frequent lubrication of the ocular surface, use high, the missile cellulose over the corneal surface, a uh, lot of the missile cellulose. This will help you to get a nice uh, surface after the surgery. Intraoperative optimization, avoid epithelial toxicity by well-tolerated non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and in some certain conditions, don't use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, non-toxic antibiotic, minimize the anesthetic as we have, seen, we have told, and visco, a lot of viscoelastic on, on the cornea. Or also to, to prevent the FCL defects, uh, avoid the corneal desiccation and no touch to the wound with the forceps. Use the spatula for manipulation. This is much better during surgery. Uh, to avoid post-surgical uh, dry eye or uh, after cataract surgery, consider that every patient will get dry eye and uh, treat the symptoms. And you can use also anti-inflammatories like cyclosporin and continue it for one and a half or two months post-surgery if there is a lot of dryness after surgery. Uh, in, patient, in patients with pre-existing dry eye, initiate cyclosporin and continue on the cyclosporin one and a half or two months post-surgery. Uh, how to avoid uh, post-surgical dry eye, aggressive lubrication, tears every two hours uh, from day one, slowly decreasing till four times, per, 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 four times per day. Also, you can use lubricating gel at night as needed. Uh, you must know the severity of the condition and you must tol tailor the, your treatment according to the conditions up to the use of autologous serum in certain very severe cases. In conclusion, dry eye disease is more common among cataract patients. You must be able to diagnose such condition. You must be able to optimize the ocular surface before surgery, modify your steps, and finally, aggressive treatment of any dry, dry eye disease post-surgery in order to get a happy patient. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ale, uh, for uh, stick to the time. And uh, may I now uh, ask uh, Dr. Siham Lazrik from Algeria to share her screen. Uh, the, the talk of uh, Dr. Siham is uh, dry eye, the missing factor in refractive surgery. So, Dr. Raale, uh, there is one question from the yes. uh, one question from the uh, audience. Do you use manual keratometry to check the presence of the dry eye on the ocular surface? That you that you, do you count on the Myers, the quality of the Myers you see of the manual keratometry on the surface of the cornea, or you stop using the manual keratometry in your practice? I have a manual keratometer in my in my clinic actually, but also in the auto uh, keratometers. You from the from the shape of the Myers on the surface of the cornea, you can anticipate any dry eye, and then you can go for topography to to to, to have a better view for this cornea. But actually, during keratometry, you can know that this case is having a dry eye. 
Okay, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Sam, it's all yours. Dr. Sam, unmute yourself. <laughs> unmute. You yes, Dr. Me? Sam? Yes, yes. You, we hear it. Uh, you are supposed to give the clinical case uh, on my own. Oh. Okay, maybe I'm not <laughs> ready, so I'm sorry for this. You can proceed for your presentation, so I would, okay. You can proceed right now. Okay, okay. Then, uh, refractive surgery is one of uh, the most uh, advancing uh, spe subspeciality in ophthalmology, uh, unless Three, uh, in less than three decades, we moved from this, from RK to fem 2 second uh, uh, reflective surgery. And with that, we have an increasing of, uh, of the expectation of the patients. They are no tolerating any uh, fluctuation of vision and uh, any, uh, uh, any complaining. And every anterior segment surgery has an impact on ocular surface. With the, and this, we have a loss of homeostasis and equilibrium in between different components of the ocular surface. And this is what is the difference between 2020 happy patients after surgery and the 2020 unhappy patients when we need, uh, we need to think about ocular surface disorders between uh, these two patients. Uh, if you go to, for example, to PubMed and to search ocular surface and refractive surgery, this is a hot topic. You will find more than 1,000 uh, publications on this, uh, on this uh, subjects. And two years ago, uh, the Dry Eye uh, Workshop 2 uh, comes with a new chapter and the new, uh, new condition, which is uh, iatrogenic dry eye with a new classification and a new uh, definition. And uh, the dry eye post-refractive surgery is the, is the, the first uh, etiology of, uh, dry, of iatrogenic dry eye after surgery, uh, as well as cataract, keratoplasty, and even uh, cross-linking and, uh, and lead surgery. And according to the 200, uh, uh, 2018 uh, uh, statistics, more than 40 million had LASIK surgery since, since 1991, and more than 1 million LASIK surgeries are performed annually in the US. Symptoms are found uh, symptoms of dry eye are found in 50% of patients who had LASIK uh, uh, at uh, one week postoperatively, 40% at four weeks, and uh, from 20 to 40% uh, uh, after six months. And uh, whatever, uh, whatever how uh, we, we name this uh, condition, uh, some authors can uh, name it also uh, postoperative neuropathic disease. Uh, what are the LASIK impacts on ocular surface? The LASIK, the LASIK impacts are on corneal sensitivity, on corneal epithelial barrier function, on the tear film sec secretion, and on the tear film stability. Uh, as you know, the, the nerves uh, enter into the cornea in the middle uh, third of the stroma between the meridians of 9 and 3, and whatever the position of the hinge, we are cutting and we are uh, enduring the, the, the corneal nerves. And you see many publications uh, had studies on uh, the position of the hedge and whatever this position, we have the stain injury of the, of the uh, corneal nerves. Then uh, the, the, cut, uh, the cut of the flap interests the nervous plexus deeper uh, in LASIK than in PRK. And in PRK, the involvement of corneal sensitivity is proportional to the ablation depth. And the nerves origination is incomplete and takes more than one year. Uh, the role of corneal nerves is to, is to trigger the corneal lid reflex, as you see, and also the corneal sensitivity is responsible of the epithelial and the tear film integrity. And then the corneal anesthesia decrease is responsible of decreasing the tear film production. Uh, as you see in this publication, we have uh, the nerves injury pre, uh, after one month of LASIK, two, three months, and after six months, we have uh, uh, Establishment of the nerves, but no, uh, as the not at integral, not as the, the, at the uh, before LASIK. And this is the same where when you have uh, uh, LASIK with the fem 2 second or LASIK with microcaraton, this is the same uh, injury of the nerves. 
the corneal uh, nerve section leads to a decrease of epithelial epithelium junction, epithelial hyperpermeability, a decrease of epithelium growing, and delay of cyclization. And the trigeminal nerves play a role in the corneal epithelial homeostasis and the back to normality, as I said uh, before, occurs after six months and uh, maybe to uh, one year. And uh, the tear film, uh, the tear film can be uh, damaged by many, uh, many ways uh, after refractive surgery. The lacrimal secretion and the mucinic expression of the corneal epithelium are inhibited by the section of the sensory in the corneal nerves. Uh, this is the same for LASIK and the uh, PRK. We have also a loss of perilambic goblet cell following trauma caused by the suction ring. We have also a decrease in blinking. Uh, due to decrease uh, in the corneal reflex and decrease of breakup time more frequent and more important in LASIK than in PRK and more important in LASIK than in smile uh, surgery. Then in summary, we have LASIK. The LASIK causes different disruption of intracorneal nerves and decrease in corneal sensitivity, decreasing uh, blink rate and uh, uh, increasing tear evaporation and uh, uh, decreasing in the tear stability and the breakup time and all this condition as they are leading for severe dry eye and uh, more symptoms for post-surgery. Then in summary, when we are doing a refractive surgery, we are creating by ourselves a real model of neurotrophic keratopathy. Then what is the impact of the surgical technique? LASIK is, uh, seems to be inducing more dry eye than, than, than PRK. As you see in this study, the LASIK uh, induce, induce more dry eye, but the, PR, but the PRK uh, are inducing more visual fluctuation. Uh, what about the smile? Uh, the smile also uh, induces dry eye, but, but it's less impacting uh, on the ocular shield face than the, the, than the, the LASIK and uh, less impacting also in the, in the quality of life. And as you see, the recovery of nerves, fibers, and density starts three months after LASIK in vivo confocal microscopy of the central uh, subbasal nerves plexus. We are, we, when we do surgery, we have also worsening of pre-existing diseases. Dry eye is a risk factor with, to increase symptoms, delay of healing, superficial keratitis, flap abnormalities, a delay recovery of corneal sensitivity, and we have also bad refractive results. As uh, Dr. Uh, Ala said, the first diopter of the eye is the tear film. We have also to be, we have to be careful with the, her uh, the antecedents of herpes, herpes disease because the herpes may be reactivating by the LASIK or uh, either by the post-operative treatment. And the herpes keratitis it leads to a corneal hyposensitivity, which will be added to the hyposensitivity of the surgery, which can be worsened by this LASIK. And uh, uh, what are the risk factors? Uh, for, for dry eye, when you have a shell less than 10 millimeter, when you have a long uh, cataract, uh, contact lens virus, this is the case for, us, for uh, of, uh, most of our patients, micro, the use of micromycin C, uh, Asian population, female population, and the age over uh, 40 years multiply the risk uh, on, on by six. We have no significant association with the depth of ablation, the position of the hinge, and even the, the use of femtosecond or, or microkeraton. Then, what is the mechanism of inflammation? When we have refractive surgery, we have when we cut the the the, the, we have the nerves, we have neural 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 distraction uh, leading to inflammation, and we have also apoptosis, apoptosis of the cells. And all this condition leading to inflammation. And as you, you know, the, in the vicious circle of the dry eye, we have the main uh, mechanism is the inflammation. Don't forget also the effect of the post-surgery treatment, uh, which uh, they are toxic. Uh, the tox the, all the all the drugs we are giving after our cell surgery may be toxic for the ocular surface, the steroids, the non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories, and the, all the pre preservative uh, uh, lubricants. Uh, then, what is the impact of the refract on the refractive surgery of the ocular surface? Okay, we, we can have unhappy patients with more symptoms and less quality of life. We have we can have insatisfaction with the quality, or low quality of vision, and uh, also reflect and, and low, uh, bad refractive predictability. What is the, the the impact of the refractive surgery on the ocular surface? It's for sure dry eye in more than four percent of patients. For, and this is for all, all, all life. 
then you will tell me you no know, we, we you know what is the relationship between uh, uh, ocular surface and the refractive surgery then what can we do before during and after lasik before lasik we need to detect uh, all the diseases and to prepare the ocular surface and we uh, we need to start with an ocular surface examination and assessment and the lasik is not indicated if the preoperative treatment don't decrease the ocular surface inflammation or don't restore the integrity of the tear film or no not recover the corneal sensitivity in these cases we need to uh, to look for another uh, so an alternative solution, PRK, ICL, or refractive lens exchange. And in my opinion, the, the most important thing to do before surgery is to inform the patient. When the patient is info uh, informed before surgery, he will not complain and he will not uh, be uh, 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 unsatisfied. What can we do during the surgery? We need to take some precautions to limit the number of installation of anesthetic eye which are toxic for keratocytes. The use of BSS and carboxyl cellulose to limit the traumatism of ocular surface and to avoid excessive manipulation to limit epithelial cell loss. And after surgery, we need to follow up and customize the treatment uh, of the patient. We don't need to have the same prescription for all, all our patients. We need to customize our prescriptions. And before to do any prescription, we need to evaluate the, the effects of the surgery. We need to uh, evaluate the nerve injury, the inflammation, the epitheliopathies, the ocular surface involvement, and if we are worsening uh, a pre-existing disease. Then what is the treatment? The treatment must be minimum lubricant for at least six months, for sure preservative-free lubricants, and don't hesitate to put punctal plagues in some cases, uh, in some uh, severe cases. Then, uh, Dr. Asser didn't uh, uh, present the clinical case. It was the clinical case of one uh, patient without any clinical sign, but uh, uh, after refractive, refractive surgery, uh, no clinical sign, but complaining severely and badly. Uh, and we, in this case, uh, our uh, patient was, was uh, menacing to uh, suicide and don't forget we, we need to keep in mind this this sad story of uh, the suicide after smile of uh, the famous Jessica Starr in 218 then don't don't uh, we need to to be um, to, to don't ignore the symptoms of our patients because, because they are really suffering from this dry eye after surgery and we, I, I found in internet many, many stories of suicide after, uh, after uh, refractive surgery for dry eye, of course, for uh, dry eye. Then in conclusion, refractive surgery and ocular surface are a conflicted uh, couple. Dry eye in the, is the most frequent complication of refractive surgery, and it's most, uh, cause of, uh, it is the most co uh, important cause of insatisfaction after uh, surgery. And uh, then uh, informing patients is an essential step of procedure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Seham. A wonderful presentation. I'm sorry I didn't show up here at the case. It's okay. Anyhow, <laughs> no. yeah, well, there's a, a question from the audience. Uh, do you use the Sherman test? You're still using the Sherman test because some of the uh, uh, doctors now don't believe too much in the Sherman test. Are you still using the Sherman test so far? Oh, yes. Oh yes, I'm still yeah. using it, but I have also another machine where I can also use the tear meniscus, meniscus higher uh, in uh, some machines. But this, the Schirmer test is the still, uh, still a gold standard in the volumetry of uh, tear. Okay, uh, now uh, for coming now, Dr. Mazen Sinjab uh, from uh, Syria, he will talk about uh, what's below the epithelium. Dr. Mazen, uh, suppose that this is the patient comes to your office and asks for refractive surgery. Would you please comment on this tomography? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, actually, uh, this is a corneal irregularity, of course, and uh, we have to know why there is a corneal ir irregularity. Because um, from time to time, we face such cases, and we may think that it's a kind of ectasia or uh, keratoconus. But one of the main factors is dry eye. Uh, and I'm going to, to present now how to differentiate such cases from the ectatic corneal diseases. OK, I'll stop sharing now. You can share your screen, please.
Okay, so uh, as I said, that from time to time we may face such cases of hotspots that uh, we may think it is an ectasia. And um, first of all, we have to exclude factors of false findings, like contact lens wear, misalignment during taking the capture, large angle kappa, tear film disturbance, including, of course, the dry eye, corneal opacities and pathologies, previous corneal surgeries, bad exposure to the camera during taking the capture, and pregnancy. Now, uh, let's agree that this is a case of irregular cornea. Now, the major three causes or sources of corneal irregularities are ectetic corneal diseases, dry eye, and contact lens warpage, and scars. I'm not going to talk about the scars because it will take about one lecture uh, for itself. So uh, what I'm going to, to do now is to differentiate between these two entities by um, uh, the, the epithelial mapping and corneal mapping. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, uh, capture of the cornea starts from the tear film, um, as uh, the colleagues mentioned. Uh, in addition, the impact of dry eye on decision making includes uh, the effect of um, uh, the effect on visual acuity, care readings and uh, measurements, uh, high order aberrations, and the induction of corneal irregularities. And the most important is the induction of corneal irregularities. So this is a case um, uh, of uh, corneal irregularity and uh, because of the dry eye, and this is high order aberrations because of the dry eye. As you see, the uh, RMS of the total high order aberrations is 0 0.82 microns on account of the trefoil. So to uh, understand what's going on, we have to study the anterior surface and the posterior surface, both together. The anterior surface is studied by the elevation, the anterior elevation by studying the epithelium and by studying the stroma through the stromal elevation. Uh, the posterior elevation, or oh, sorry, the posterior surface should be studied by using the posterior elevation and the posterior tangential curvature map. But before this, we have to know the properties of the uh, corneal uh, epithelium because it has a masking effect. As you see here, uh, this is a corneal scar. Uh, above the scar, because there is a shrinkage, the epithelium thickens in order to mask this irregularity and thins over the um, better uh, places. Now, this is a case of intracorneal rings. Look at these areas, how thick is the epithelium? Um, this is the case of intracorneal ring, and you see that there are two islands or two bananas uh, just over the uh, or above the uh, intracorneal rings. Uh, we can see because of the masking effect, we can see this pattern uh, in keratoconus. The uh, epithelium thins over the cone and thicken above the cone. And this is a vertical asymmetry in corneal thickness map. And this is because of the masking effect of the uh, epithelium. Uh, there is another masking effect of the epithelium, uh, post-myopic and post-hyperopic treatment. This is a case of post-myopic treatment. We can see that there is an island of very thick epithelium covering the flat uh, central part of the cornea. And this is one of the uh, causes of uh, loss of effect. I'm not talking about regression of myopia. I'm talking about loss of, of effect of the myopic ablation. The same can be said in case of hyperopic treatment. So in general, there is an agreement between epithelium and stroma. The, epi the epithelium says to the stroma, if you steepen, I'm going to thin in order to mask. And if you thicken, I'm going, uh, or if you flatten, I'm going to thick, to be thicker in order to mask as well. So as you see here, this is the stromal elevation. There is a bulging in this area. So the epithelium thickens, um, uh, uh, thins, sorry, over this bulging in order to give better regularity uh, in the anterior corneal surface for optical uh, purposes. Uh, this is a case of corneal scar. As you see, the, uh, this area is very flat in the stroma and it is filled with epithelium uh, in order to give better regularity of anterior corneal surface. Now, what about the changes in the ectatic corneal diseases? Actually, the changes in ectatic corneal diseases start from the posterior surface. So we cannot say that there is an ectatic corneal disease without uh, an, a change in the posterior surface. Usually, we see a bulging in the uh, posterior surface. Then the bulging will be transferred to the anterior part of the stroma, which will bulge. And uh, the uh, epithelium will thin over the bulging in order to give a smooth 
anterior surface, as you see. Now, um, this happens as long as this is within the capacity of the epithelium to compensate for the steepening of the stroma. But whenever the steepening gets more um, and uh, uh, the epithelium cannot compensate for, this is beyond the capacity of the epithelium to, uh, to compensate, then the anterior surface starts to show the irregularity. So whenever we see an irregularity on the anterior surface, there is um, uh, like uh, irregularity in the stroma, which is uh, beyond the capacity of the epithelium to compensate for it. Now we come to the uh, patterns of epithelial changes in the active cor corneal diseases. We find focal thinning, we find anterior superior asymmetry, we find radial thinning, and we find generalized thinning. This is a case of focal thinning, and this is a case of inferior superior thinning, and this is another case of inferior superior asymmetry, and this is radial thinning in the cornea because of keratoconus, um, and this is generalized thinning. Uh, regarding the stromal changes in active corneal diseases, there is a main uh, change which is inferior superior asymmetry. As we see here, there is inferior superior asymmetry in the stromal elevation. Uh, regarding the posterior surface, we can study by posterior elevation map and posterior tangential map, both together. Why? Because sometimes some changes may uh, appear on the tangential map before the uh, posterior elevation map. So this is a posterior elevation map in keratoconus, and this is the posterior tangential map in keratoconus. So as we said that the changes and the ectotic corneal diseases, they start from the posterior surface and then they progress to the anterior corneal surface. So if there is an epithelium problem plus posterior surface, there is ectotic corneal disease. But what about, uh, this is um, uh, keratoconus. This is a case of keratoconus. As we see, there is um, a hotspot uh, corresponding to the uh, vertical asymmetry and the epithelial thickness map and posterior bulging on the posterior elevation map. Now, this is another case. There is um, inferior hotspot, and there is radial thinning in the epithelium corresponding to the posterior elevation bulging. Now, regarding the dry eye and contact lens warpage, um, uh, uh, cont contact lens warpage uh, causes uh, uh, changes, which is very, very similar to dry eye. This is why I put both together uh, in this slide. So there are two changes in the dry eye and contact lens warpage. Um, no change in the posterior surface, no change in the stroma, but there will be either thickening in the epithelium or there will be irregular epithelium. Uh, this is a case of dry eye. As you see, there is uh, inferior hotspot and we may think that this patient cannot go for treatment for LASIK or uh, anyhow, uh, any type, but if we look at the uh, thickness map, we can find that uh, it is an irregular thickness map, and we can find that the elevation map is very uh, regular. So uh, it is not a case of ectasia, it is a case of dry eye. And <clears throat> if you look at the stromal elevation, you can find that there is no uh, superior inferior asymmetry. This is another case of dry eye. As you see, there is irregularity in the sagittal anterior curvature map, uh, there is irregularity in the epithelial thickness map. And regarding the posterior elevation, we can say that this is normal posterior elevation and there is no asymmetry in the uh, stromal elevation as well. This is, this is a third case of dry eye. We can see that there is thickening of the epithelium. This is um, the hotspot on, on the sagittal anterior curvature map but this is accompanied with thickening of the epithelium. This is an eyelid of uh, thickening. Uh, in addition to a very regular posterior elevation, uh, there is no asymmetry in the uh, stromal elevation. This is a case of contact lens, warp or, uh, lens warpage. Uh, this patient came for refractive surgery, and when we did the, uh, uh, the topography, uh, there was a hotspot, as you see here, but when we studied the epithelial mapping, the hotspot corresponds to a thick focal thickening of the cornea of the epithelium rather than thinning. So in this case, uh, this uh, thickening in the epithelium can explain why there is a hotspot because it is hyperplasia because of the contact lens. And the posterior elevation map is very normal. 
and for the uh, posterior, uh, sorry, for the stromal elevation is very normal. So I take the take home message, uh, let's say that whenever we face such cases of irregularities, we have to think of uh, dry eye and um, um, uh, such as these irregularities, um, especially when there is like high order aberrations because of the ir irregularities. And uh, to say that there is an ectatic corneal disease, there must be an abnormal uh, epithelium and abnormal posterior surface. And if there is an abnormal epithelium and normal posterior surface, so it is either dry eye or contact lens warpage. And we have to differentiate both entities um, uh, from the uh, scar, corneal scar, which takes special patterns. And maybe in another lecture, we can talk about this. But I would like to finalize with this slide that be careful, don't put any drop in, in the eye before taking the capture uh, to the patient because all drops may affect the integrity of the tear film and the epithelial uh, of the, and the epithelium, especially those used for dilating the pupil or anesthesia drops because this will affect the picture of the tomography. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mazin. Very interesting subject now up to date, uh, which is the corneal epithelial mapping uh, in the refractive surgery and its relation to the dry eye. Let me ask you a question. Uh, you saw last a case of contact lens warpage, which uh, showed uh, some hot spot on the axial map corresponds to thickening of the epithelium at the same location. And you concluded this is a, um, a case of uh, contact lens warpage because of the posterior elevation was normal. So how long, if you, if you just uh, refrain, uh, ask the patient to stop contact lens using for one or two weeks, would you think that the corneal epithelium will regain its to normal thickness again or will remain hyperplastic? No, it, uh, uh, let's say that the irregularity will disappear, but of course it may take more than one week. So usually when I see this irregularity, I ask the patient to stop the contact lenses and use uh, uh, drops for the dry eye uh, for at least one month. I see. So, one, and you do a epithelial mapping again? Yeah, of course. I repeat. And if I see, still I see the same problem, then I, I should wait more than this. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, uh, doctor, I think this is for uh, Dr. Siham. Do you use uh, cyclosporin? Uh, uh, after uh, LASIK or any refractive procedure on the cornea, Dr. Siham? Uh, I, I don't use it uh, for every patient, but if you have uh, a lot of complaining and after six months we have less, the patient is still complaining, we, we may use uh, stasis or uh, other, uh, other drug or other cyclosporine, but not, um, not at, uh, at the day, not just after surgery. After surgery, we, we need preservative free lubricant maybe punctal plugs, and we, and we wait. Okay, so this is an open uh, question for the panel. Uh, how can you differentiate the dry eye it's coming from the lipid layer or from the aqueous layer? This is one question from the audience. This is very this is easy. Question. This yeah. is very how? easy. Uh, this is two different, uh, two different dry eyes. When it's from uh, the lipid layer, this is uh, an, uh, this is an uh, evaporative dry eye. The breakup time is is uh, is low, and uh, when is when is uh, acute, uh, this is uh, we the the Schirmer is low, and this is two different uh, pathologies. And now, if you have an ocular surface analyzer, you can uh, do interferometry. When the interferometry is low. Then we, you, you, are, you are facing a um, uh, problem in the in the in the lipid layer, and if the tear meniscus is low, you are facing uh, an, an, an acute dry eye deficiency. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are on time now. May I ask uh, Dr. Um, uh, Margaret McDonald? She is the pioneer of the refractive surgery worldwide. I'm very honored uh, that she could make it, uh, make it here with us. And thank you very much for being with us from such a long distance in the United States. I know that you are very, very busy. Uh, Dr. Margaret McDonald will talk about the link between the dry eye and refractive surgery. Please, Dr. McDonald, it's also yours. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Um, Hmm. Okay, share. There we go. Okay. Okay. Can you see it? 
Yeah. Okay, great. So <clears throat> I'm going to approach the subject of refractive surgery and dry eye um, from a slightly different uh, point of view. First, we're going to start out with the incidence or prevalence of dry eye. Uh, as other speakers have told you, dry eye is the most common complication of LASIK. So there was an exhaustive review of the world's literature on the subject. And it was a joint task force of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the FDA, and uh, the lead authors were the group of doctors that you see here. They started with 1,581 publications, some in English, some not in English. ASCRS had translation done on many of them from Danish and Finnish and Russian. And of those, 60 were excluded because the series was too small or the science wasn't strong enough. So they reviewed a total in the end, a total of 2,915 abstracts. And finally, they culled the best ones, the ones that concentrated on dry eye with solid science, and they ended up with 46 that had reviewable data. So these 46 articles with high quality data came from 13 journals, 15 countries, and covered over 32,000 eyes. And to go straight to the conclusion, they said that the pre-op rate of dry eye was 32%, and at six months, the post-op rate was 35%, basically about the same. So they concluded that refractive surgeon should identify candidates with symptoms or signs of dry eye during the pre-op evaluation, but those patients are at greater risk for post-LASIK dry eye, and the vigilant identification of these candidates allows for proper counseling, pretreatment, and in some rare cases, even exclusion from LASIK surgery. There was another huge series of eyes reported by Steve Schallhorn. Dr. Schallhorn was the medical director of Optical Express, which is the largest corporate purveyor of LASIK in the world. He reviewed over 32,000 eyes in uh, Optical Express. Once again, dry eye was the most common side effect reported. This impacted patient satisfaction. The predictive factors that they identified in this retrospective study were uh, that being female was strongly predictive of post-LASIK dry eye, that PRK produced more dry eye than LASIK. Now, I must say, the Optical Express surgeons are told that if a patient has significant dry eye, they'd be safer doing PRK, so perhaps that is biased. But at any rate, a pre-op diagnosis of hyperopia was also a risk factor. There were um, other... Um, factors that were statistically significant but had little predictive value, such as age, age tear breakup time, SPK ablation depth, and flap type. So they concluded age was not an independent predictor. They thought that LASIK reduced the risk versus PRK. I've already commented on that. That hyperopic females with dry eye symptoms before surgery and who undergo PRK are at higher risk. And even at 12 months, patients with dry eye still had decreased procedure satisfaction. So what to expect? In the Schallhorn study, he said, about 85% of LASIK patients are gonna have symptoms at one week post-op, 60% at one month, 11.3% at three months, and only 7% had symptoms at 12 months, representing the, the fact that most patients finally go back to baseline at a year. So as others have said, the quality of vision starts with a healthy tear film. All of our recent advances in technology are lost. If there's even the most tiny disruption, disruption of the ocular surface, and others have also pointed out that the tear film is the most important refracting surface of the entire eye. So the risk of this complication can be minimized with an intelligent approach to this. And at every step, the surgeon can take appropriate steps that will optimize the outcome and minimize post-op dry eye. Basically, there are four stages or four steps. One, identify patients at risk for dry eye. 
to maximize the chair film uh, stability preoperatively, take steps during surgery to minimize dry eye and post-op therapeutic intervention. But first, why do patients get dry eye after LASIK? Well, LASIK patients are often contact lens intolerant. That's what brought them to us with borderline pre-op dry eye. There's damage to the goblet cells during LASIK. That's exactly where the suction ring sits and smashes a high percentage of the uh, total number of goblet cells. Also, there are changes in the corneal curvature that can result in decreased tear wetting secondary to the lid movement. Medicamentosum from toxic antibiotics, NSAIDs and preservatives, and of course, severing of the, severing of the corneal nerves by the keratome or the femtosecond laser, and damage by photoablation itself gives us, as you've heard, our neurotrophic cornea with a reduced feedback loop to produce tears. So pre-op, we evaluate the dry eye status with lysamine green or rose bengal. They both do the same thing, and they'll show us conjunctival and corneal staining. The Schirmer's test, tear meniscus height, and corneal sensation testing. So support the tear film preoperatively. You can use transiently, gently, or preservative-free tears. Uh, gels and ointments at night are great, and even punctal occlusion if needed. Uh, we all know to avoid benzalconium chloride as much as possible. Uh, the Sustain line has uh, polyquad, which is the gentlest of the preservatives and very, very small amounts of that. So if they have lid disease, hot soaks and scrubs twice a day with bacitracin ointment at night, ophthalmic ointment, and even oral doxycycline, doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for two weeks is extremely helpful. Also, pre-op, high-dose omega-3s. You can use high-dose cod liver oil for EPA. Uh, you can get flaxseed oil with, with the omegas, as I mentioned. And you can use topical cyclosporin, and I have used that a great deal. And this just shows one of the many papers proving that cyclosporin decreases blurred vision as early as one month. Uh, the bright blue bar is the cyclosporin 0.05%, which is commonly available, and it has a profound impact, even more so than the stronger solution of cyclosporin that was 0.1%. And, <clears throat> you know, there are papers showing that pre-op cyclosporin improves ocular surface and improves LASIK results. Years ago, uh, you see the first reference, George Salib and I uh, published this, and we used it, whether the patients had dry eye or not, we actually started at one month pre-op and continued it for at least three months post-op, and it had an impact in outcomes. So intra-op, we should avoid epithelial toxicity. And you, know, you don't need that much anesthetic during surgery, just use what's barely needed. Uh, sometimes you have an assistant who's a little uh, too enthusiastic putting anesthetic drops in, and that should be avoided at all costs. And of course, to prevent epithelial defects is key. Lubricating the cornea prior to the keratone pass or application of the femtosecond laser. And um, use a highly viscous lubricant to protect the ocular surface, especially one that has carboxymethyl cellulose. So that is critical. Now, corneal sensation and dry eye, we know corneal sensation is vital for maintaining corneal epithelial integrity and wound healing. And uh, there is a significant decrease in corneal sensation. We are creating neurotrophic corneas. They have fluctuating vision, they have interpalpebral punctate keratitis. And we know that a, uh, the use of topical anesthetic decreases tear production instantly by 60 to 75% and that intact corneal sensation is absolutely required for normal tear production. We know that the long ciliary nerves are what provide corneal innervation, the first branch of the cranial nerve number five, and they come in at three and nine o'clock, 293 microns below the corneal surface. They quickly bifurcate and move towards six and 12, and they also move anteriorly, and they form dense subepithelial plexi and they penetrate Bowman's layer and terminate in the wing cell layer of the epithelium. So this is sort of a sketch from the classic uh, Mueller paper in 1996. And um, 
this has already been touched upon, but um, the location of the hinge uh, and the size of the hinge are both critical. So a nasal hinge will increase corneal sensation by sparing at least one of the two big trunks coming into the cornea, two big nerve trunks. And there's decreased corneal staining with nasal hinge flaps, as you see. A superior flap transects both the nasal and the temporal trunks as, as they enter the cornea. So that's why uh, it's better to stay with a, a nasal hinge, if at all possible. So this is just a, a sketch, and you can see the not only uh, is a wide hinge more favorable to corneal innervation, it's also a more stable flap. It's less likely to swing or pivot. And a 9.5 millimeter flap is gonna transect 25% greater surface area of the cornea than an 8.5 millimeter flap. And um, it's gonna transect them in the periphery before they have bifurcated. So this is a huge loss of sensation. And it, whether you have a nasal or a superior hinge flap, the bigger the flap, the worse the problem, as you see here. This is what a small flap will sever. This is what a larger flap will sever. So, you know, increased dry eye is probably related to larger, superior, and narrow hinged flaps. So, for patients with diminished pre op corneal sensation or pre op dry eye, we recommend a small nasal flap with a wide hinge, if at all possible. So post-op, aggressive scheduled lubrication is critical. Viscous drops on day one are very good, such as sustained gel drops. Transiently, gently, or completely non-preserved tears during week one. Lubricating ointment at night if needed. And you should consider the addition of a lipid-containing emulsion when lid disease is present or a tear breakup time is diminished. Every single patient, every LASIK patient, gets dry eye. The question is whether they know it or not. We have just severed a lot of their corneal nerves, so they don't have much pain or irritation, but they have fluctuating vision due to the disruption of the ocular surface. So we should treat fluctuating vision as dry eye until proven otherwise. Uh, coming down the pipeline are oral secretagogues, topical mucin secretagogues, topical androgens, and nerve growth factor. So with intelligent Pre-op, inter-op, and post-op management, the incidence and severity of LASIK-related dry eye can be significantly decreased. And I just want to uh, thank my colleagues in Egypt for spending time with me. Uh, Egypt is one of my, my very favorite places on Earth, so barak fiku. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk, uh, Margaret. Uh, it's truly, you, you, you really touch a very important point, which is the size of the flap. We used to hear uh, more about this uh, location of the hinge, but uh, the size of the flap is usually underestimated. So suppose that you have a patient, for example, that you are going to ablate a large optic zone and large transition zone, and you are now in between reducing the size, making the flap smaller, or, uh, keep the flap bigger for the quality of vision for this ablation profile, whatever. It's like a stigmatic, for example, ablation. So would you recommend to use, still use the small size of the flap and uh, risk the quality of vision in these cases, or you prefer to go for the quality of vision and treat the dry eye, whatever it takes? Well, I would treat the dry eye, but I would probably do uh, an iteration of surface ablation called EBK, Epi Bowman's Keratectomy, which I do a lot of. So you can have your big, beautiful ablation zone and a nice transition zone. You have pre-treated the dry eye, of course, but those eyes will do very well and you don't sacrifice anything optically. And what about the surface ablation? Does it have any rule here? I, well, I did surface ablation in the beginning. Then I switched to LASIK like everyone else. More recently, I do a great deal of surface ablation, but only with EBK, Epi Bowman's keratectomy, using a small disposable handheld instrument that scoops up the epithelium in sheets. It spares Bowman's layer and it spares basement membrane. And they recover so quickly. They're re-epithelialized in two days usually, sometimes three. There's no pain. Um, they, they come in smiling the first day post-op. Most of them drive in 
the first day post-op. So the speed of return of vision and the comfort level is extremely competitive with LASIK and you don't have a flap. Okay, thank you very much for being of us, with us. Uh, thank you again. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, in this webinar. Thank you. So, thank you. So may I call now uh, my dear colleague, Mohammed Fakhri from uh, Egypt to share his screen. Can you hear me now? Yes, sure. So, so do you Mohammed, have a case? Yes. Yes, yes, just a moment here. Okay. So, Mohammed, now, suppose this is a lady, 23 years old lady, is asking for refractive surgery. Okay, now you can see that I'm sorry for the quality of the photos here, it's not, uh, it's a little bit blurry. But uh, would you comment here on this pentacam of this patient and the surface? Yeah, well, uh, okay, good that you have the uh, uh, elevation maps. Uh, it's quite obvious that uh, with the tear breakup time, there's a problem. And uh, the, the topography shows what Dr. Mazin was uh, uh, explaining with the uh, dry eye and contact lens warpage syndrome. Uh, why did I assume it's not an ectatic corneal condition? Uh, by checking the elevation maps uh, and the Bill and Ambrosio display, uh, they are uh, both normal. So I have to assume that this is uh, a mix of dry eye and contact lens warpage syndrome. Uh, so to me, uh, I would not do LASIK. I would I would postpone the, the surgery, uh, 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 forbid the patient from using contact lens for at least a month, and use uh, topical lubricants and redo. Uh, this this is. Uh, I see this uh, second one to the right one, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a minimal improvement, so I would go for uh, uh, surface uh, ablation. Uh, I would not go for LASIK. So you integrate the clinical data you get from the slit lamp together with the tomography maps, so I do get an idea about the surface, the quality of the surface of this eye, and take you make your decision regarding the surface ablation or doing LASIK. Okay, yeah. so let's now move to your talk. Please, can you please, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and yes. now you can, okay. It's all yours right now. Okay. Okay, uh, now I have an easy task and I have a difficult task. The easy one is just to mention my talk because most of the talk was mentioned with Dr. Mazen, uh, Dr. Ala, Dr. Margaret, and Dr. Siham. Uh, the tough one is to try and uh, explain about surface ablation in the presence of Dr. Margaret. Uh, it's like trying to explain gravity theory in the presence of Einstein, but I'll try and do my very best. Uh, first of all, we have to pay tribute uh, to the uh, uh, all the pioneers of uh, laser vision correction. Uh, PRK still, sorry about that. There's a problem with the, with the upload. Hello, Dr. Mohammed. Yes, yes, I'm trying okay. to. Okay, okay, now that just. Yeah, okay. I just, okay. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, PRK stood the test of time. Actually, I don't know what's problem with the presentation. I'll share it once more. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem, it's technical issues we use to this. Yes, yes. There's a problem with the, with the upload. 
Okay, uh, we can we can shift to uh, Dr. Omid. You have set the time of the slides to be automatic. So no, no, it's it's manual. Okay, uh, you can restart uh, the presentation, and uh, I will shift uh, to Dr. Omid Kermani, then come back to you. Okay. 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 So uh, uh, I'm pleased to uh, Dr. Magid, uh, Dr. Omid, are you here with us? Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I know you had a very hard time uh, to catch up with us last uh, 48 hours. And uh, I truly appreciate your effort uh, and caring to be with us in this webinar from Germany. So uh, uh, Dr. Omid Kermani is very uh, well known in uh, international as well as refractive surgeon in Germany worldwide. And he, I think you did LASIK upon yourself, Molo Vision Life, right? Yes, and I would like to share um, the perception of the patient. Um, yes. So, uh, so we have we have a patient right now with us here. <laughs> yeah, we have a patient. Yeah. So okay. If, if you like, I share my my screen with you. And, yes, please. Uh, let's see. So there we are. Uh, okay. I have no financial interest in this topic, um, and um, I just tried to go to the background of my, my history. And uh, basically, uh, it, it was that I was really tired of wearing glasses. I had to start reading glasses at age uh, 45, <clears throat> and then uh, I became hyperopic at age 50, and I needed, um, uh, I needed uh, a distance correction as well. And, uh, I, as you can see, I had many different glasses uh, for different uh, tasks that I have to fulfill at work, um, in sports, uh, car driving, in sun, under the sunshine, and so on. So I really was feeling frust frustrated, uh, treating all the time my patients, seeing them very happy, um, and being unhappy myself. So I had to look for a solution. Uh, this was my preoperative uh, refraction. Uh, is a hyperopia of plus 1.5, no significant astigmatism and uh, addition of almost two diopter, which is not so bad for uh, my age. Now, um, in times of Facebook, um, I posted my case um, and I asked for advice from my colleagues and experts. And I'm not going into all the different methods that uh, were not proposed and that were not mentioned. Basically, there are two um, alternatives that uh, we have been discussing and one was a refractive lens exchange um, and the other one was um, laser vision correction. Now for refractive lens exchange I personally felt not right at that situation because I have no signs of lens deficiency syndrome at all. My best corrected visual acuity is 1.6 and my lens is clear. So I was afraid of doing this. Also, I've seen patients uh, after refractive lens surgery with uh, vitreous problems. So um, Dan Reinstein did a significant lot of work and with regard to refine monovision uh, in such a way uh, that he shaped the cornea in order to increase the depth of focus by, by changing the spherical, the asphericity of the eye. Damien Gatinell did the same thing and published it in, uh, in, with a NIDAC laser. And I have a little bit of experience with uh, uh, hyperopic treatments as well. Well, uh, there are always uh, these comments which make you a little bit insecure. Usually doctors do not make good patients, but I was really, I was really happy to do it and I was really um, without any doubt about it. So, um, the difference between micro monovision and laser blended vision as Dan Reinstein uh, names this kind of procedure is really about the asphericity of the cornea. Um, by changing the Q value of the eye, um, you can increase depth of focus. Now, um, the evolution has given us a shape of the cornea in such a way that our demands in nature can be fulfilled. And the human being, the homo sapiens, is somewhere in between these two extremes of corneal shapes. Um, the asphericity can be described as a Q value. And uh, usually in the in a mean eye, uh, it is about minus 0.2. So we have a negative asphericity uh, in the normal eye. Um, 
if you increase the asphericity, the negative asphericity, you can increase the depth of focus as shown here. And this is being used for blended vision or micro monovision as we use it in hyperopic or presbyopic um, treatments with LASIK. Now, this was my treatment. I will just go through it just to prove that I, it's really me I'm talking about. Um, and I'd just like to um, mention that uh, Carl Schmidt did the surgery very well. I have been asked where are you going to have, have it done. And of course, uh, the best place you, you can trust is the place where you know the equipment. Um, and who could be a better surgeon than the one that whom you have taught? to do the surgery. So I knew exactly what he was doing. We discussed it and it was fine. This treatment itself was not painful at all. Uh, it was kind of a psychedelic experience a little bit. I was um, a little bit dizzy from the medication, but uh, it felt all right. It was not stressful for me at all. Now, this was the treatment plan for the right eye. And please note that the target cue for the distance eye, so the right eye is my distance eye, uh, was not changed. I, I set the target for o, minus 0 0.27 as it was before. Um, the left eye is the reading eye. The effective target was minus 1.75 and the target Q here was minus 0 0.6, which is recommended to be a good target Q for reading ambitions. So uh, that was the treatment plan. And this is the outcome, as you can see it on the, on the Pentacam or the tomo uh, tomography. And you can see uh, the pronounced um, um, steepening of the cornea of the left side, where the correction was almost four diopters. It was 3.25 diopters. And you can see it on the difference maps of the topography. Now, of course, I checked uh, the safety. And um, at my clinic, we do screen the safety with the biomechanical index. We check the uh, TBI preoperative. Um, it was not perfect, but it was not that bad. It was the TBI was, let's say, it was okay. It was acceptable. And since my corneal thickness was fine and I'm not so young anymore, I'm 59. My cornea has stiffened anyway because of natural um, 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 uh, sunlight exposure. I thought it's fine to do it. The post-LASIK Ectasia TBI, a new test that we can do um, on eyes that have had uh, LASIK, um, this is post-operative, showed that I have a very good value with a zero on, on both eyes. So from this point of view, there was no, um, no problem, no safety issue with regard to Ectasia. In general, you usually do not have really ectasia problems because you don't ablate the center of the eye. Now the post-op refraction, it's a little bit overcorrected, so both on the right and the left eye, a quarter of a diopter. But if you look at the 10-year refraction history, um, pre-op my refraction was stable over 10 years. There was an increase of one diopter over 10 years to the hyperopia. And post-operatively, there's a little of, bit of regression. And I hope that it will regret uh, re regress a little bit more, maybe a quarter of a diopter, and I'm just perfect. But right now, I can see 120% um, distance vision, best corrected, and this is important. I did not lose anything in best corrected visual acuity 1.6 for both eyes. What is most important for me personally in terms of uh, comfort is that my binocular defocus curve with this procedure is uh, full uh, in the pseudo accommodation. Uh, my defocus curve is just very much the binocular one, of course, uh, like the one of a young person. And, and this is tested with uncorrected visual acuity. So with regard to this, um, uh, in the functional outcome, outcome was excellent. Um, though the higher order aberration, as you can expect in hyperopic LASIK, did um, increase a little bit, not that much. It was very little with 0.2 prior to the operation, 0.4 after the operation on the right eye, and uh, on the left eye from uh, almost 1.2, a little more increase to 1.3. Interestingly, the left eye was the eye with the higher ablation, but it, did, uh, it, it showed less increase in higher order aberration. Now, how was the post of recovery? And this is, of course, the topic of this meeting. Um, and I can um, share my, my, uh, my, my course with you. Um, I had significant temporarily 
host of complaints with regard to, to Sika, to dry eye. And for me personally, the most difficult situation was in the early morning when I woke up. I had difficulties to open the eyes. And, and this redness, as you can see from this picture on the right side, it very much resembles how my eyes were looking in the beginning uh, when I woke up. Computer work was difficult for me, especially more than half an hour or one hour. Um, I started to, to suffer from dry eye. Uh, along with this, uh, not only the Sika, but also in the beginning, the anisometropia at night was disturbing me. I had significant night vision problems and I had fluctuations of visual acuity, which might be also due to regression a little bit, but that was not so much. Um, I agree to all of you from your previous talks that is, of course, the cause of, um, of the Sika, of the dry eye. Now, I have documented um, the way I have uh, treated my eyes and the way I um, sense the night vision complaints. And you can see that the time course from the initial time after the operation until three months uh, post-operatively, the night vision complaints decrease as the uh, necessity of uh, putting eye drops into my eyes. So there is, I personally think, a correlation between um, the, the dryness of the eye and the night vision disturbances. In the first four to five weeks, I also used ointments at night. And now I only use once in a while uh, artificial tears. Otherwise, um, I'm fine. This uh, uh, is shown in the reflectivity, um, the pre and post op, um, um, as you can see on the right eye, which has a little hyperopic treatment of 1.5 diopter only. And you see the imaging is good only in the mid periphery. There is a slight inconsistency of the rings um, compared to the pre op situation, and that very much uh, matches the shape of the cornea after hyperopic ablation, uh, which is pronounced on the left eye where the hyperopic ablation was 3.5 diopter. So it's a very simple and effective method to qualify um, the, the, um, the tear film uh, by just looking at the reflectivity of the placido rings from your topographer. Uh, my personal seeker therapy, and, and I don't want to uh, um, um, mention that, that other eye drops might be working as well for other patients. I tested different eye drops Basically, I like those drops that have a combination between a lubricants and uh, a, a bio, um, 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 uh, um, a, a ingredient that comes from nature that helps to prevent dry out um, of, of membranes. So this is found both in the Stan and the Tealos Duo. They work very nice for me. Um, I, also would like to mention that the supplements, well, it's not really proven, but um, I believe in this. And for me, it worked very fine with the vitamin D and of course the vitamin C, because I think the vitamin C catches the radicals. And if there's an inflammatory process going on, uh, vitamin C maybe is at, at the stage that I was in, um, not as invasive as cyclosporin. Um, Omega-3 uh, has been mentioned. I think it's very important. And the ointment at night, I used uh, dexpentanol gels. Now, six months post-op, the osmolarity of my tear film is back to normal. I'm absolutely fine. I have no complaints so far. And in conclusion, I may say that my presbyopic custom Q, femtolasic and monovision worked very fine for me. Six months post-op, I'm absolutely spectacle-free at all times. My uh, tear film decompensates slightly a little bit accelerated. I don't have dry eyes, but I, I see that uh, uh, the decompensation is earlier than I was used to it uh, before the operation. So um, the, the stress resistance is not as good as before the operation, but I don't think that it's caused to the uh, to the... Uh, amount of, of tear film, I think it's basically uh, due to the shape of the cornea, which gives stress to the uh, tear film. Night vision complaint, they st strongly correlate with the tear film stability. I don't have any night vision complaints anymore. I do sense the monovision. Um, actually, I can play with it, but I have no problems with binocular vision at all by now. After one or two months, uh, it, it went just normal for me. 
I continue with the oral supplements. And uh, I may say that uh, after this personal experience, I wish I had done my LISIC 10 years before. I like to thank you very much for your interest in my own case. And sometimes it's nice to be a patient and to see the world from another perspective. You do learn a lot uh, about uh, uh, science when it comes to flesh. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, talk uh, from both perspectives, the doctors as well as the patient perspective. Let me ask you a question. Uh, do you think the ablation profile, because you were hypropic before LASIK, do you think the ablation profile has something to do with the dry eye after the LASIK? Maybe? Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, the, 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 that, that's one of the reasons um, where, where you can really influence um, the outcome when you um, treat the cornea in such a way that the res resulting uh, shape is not, let's say, um, um, uh, magic to the functionality. Um, high ablations in myopia, let's say more than six, seven or eight diopters, they cause dry eye as much as hyperopic ablations. In hyperopia, of course, the, the stress resistance is not as good as with myopia because you have the steepening. But with every steepening, you have to get back to the normal shape of the cornea. And this mid-periphery of the cornea is a stress point. And therefore, I personally would not recommend to do hyperopia with the laser procedure uh, for more than plus four diopters. I see. So uh, do you still use vitamin C so far, uh, six months after the procedure? Or, or? Yes, but because of corona. <laughs> <laughs> okay so otherwise six months or three months do you recommend us to, to use yeah. vitamin c yes. three no or six I, I, think, I think vitamin c is very helpful in terms of uh, let's say naturally cope for the uh, uh, inflammatory aspect uh, margaret has talked about cyclosporin and and this is a pretty strong and expensive medication and vitamin c is uh, easy to get and i think it has uh, some helpful uh, uh, effect, especially when you start with vitamin C before the operation and continue to take it uh, further on. Also the vitamin D, don't underestimate uh, the, the role of vitamin D and zinc also. All these uh, supplements can, can support the, um, the cause of, for the patients um, and they are cheap and easy uh, and you can get them everywhere. Yeah, thank you because I think you answered one of the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, one of the audience asked about the role of diet in treatment uh, of dry eye after refractive surgery. So I think you answered this question clearly by the uh, supplement, by, uh, multi, uh, multivitamin supplement. Thank you very much for being with us. And now I will shift now for Dr. Mohamed Fakhri. I think you can share your uh, screen, please. Yes. Uh, sorry about earlier. No. It's okay. Okay, now, uh, as I said, we have to pay tribute uh, to uh, uh, all the pioneer ophthalmologists. Uh, we have Dr. Margaret with us who uh, achieved the first uh, correction with GRK surgery 2016. Uh, now, to talk about modalities of uh, surface LBC, we have the PRK ankle assisted mechanical epithelial flap creating procedure like the LASIK, the epilasic, they are not so popular nowadays. Uh, the APK that was mentioned by Dr. Margaret uh, and the transepithelial PRK. Uh, it's very popular among the refractive surgeons nowadays for uh, it reduces surgery time, it has no mechanical trauma, faster healing, uh, less pain. But the most important thing is that the epithelium act as a masking agent uh, for surface irregularities. Now, uh, what do we have to take care of? Uh, uh, dry eye related conditions before we do any laser vision correction. Uh, to start, uh, eyelid abnormalities, defaritis, uh, contact lens users, uh, chronic allergic conjunctivitis, occupational hazards like uh, computer users, uh, certain medications like antihistamines, and uh, of course the ocular surface cicatrizing disease are absolute contraindications for LVC. Uh, the tear film assessment that was described by my colleagues, uh, but the main uh, uh, topics is that we use the tear breakup time, the rose bengal staining, 
uh, Shermer testing the uh, uh, lysamine green staining score, uh, if it's geometry, if it is available in the outpatient department. The aim of all this is to grade the uh, dry eye disease uh, pre and post operatively. Uh, it was described uh, earlier by Dr. Oshino and colleagues the Japanese dry eye criteria uh, that uh, took into consideration the symptomatology of dry eye, uh, the clear breakup time, the Schirmer test without anesthesia. Uh, the modified grading uses the Schirmer test with anesthesia, uh, conjunctiva and epithelial damage, of course, by uh, uh, fluorescein staining, rose bengal, or the lysamine grain stain. Uh, now, What's dry eye? Actually, we have to define this. This was uh, discussed by all my colleagues. Uh, it's a multifactorial disease uh, of tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms that uh, ranges from mild to severe. And uh, there's a measurement of decreased aqueous tear volume and what's known as tear osmolarity, as mentioned by Dr. Ala, uh, the tear lab. Uh, the epidemiology, actually, this was mentioned by Dr. Margaret and Dr. Uh, Siham. Uh, the incidence of dry eye among laser vision uh, correction candidates ranges between 38 and 75 percent. 75 percent is a very high incidence. Uh, prevalence of LASIK induced dry eye in a completely normal uh, candidate ranges between 0.25 to 48 percent, and of course, this. It differs according to the procedure that was done, uh, if it is LASIK, if it's PRK, if it is SMILE. Uh, usually it's 90% during the first week, 60% after one month. And we're going to talk about different procedures and how they impact dry eye. But we have to know that 30% of post-LVC dry eye cases are usually referred to tertiary ophthalmology centers. That means that the traditional, the traditional ways of management of dry eye, they do not work out with such patients. Okay, now we have to, to start talking about wound healing following PRK. Uh, following photoablation, the first effect is the apoptosis, apoptosis of the keratocytes or the anterior corneal stroma. This is followed by the epithelial healing. It starts by a basal uh, one layer epithelial healing followed by full layers uh, of epithelium. Uh, then the repopulation of keratocytes from posterior to anterior corneal stroma. Uh, and the repopulation uh, is uh, usually associated with a differentiation of keratocyte to myofibroblasts. Uh, the myofibroblasts, they end up forming the abnormal collagen, which, uh, uh, which contributes to HACE, type three and type four. So the epithelial healing is the first to happen. Uh, from label to central, basal to superficial. The stromal uh, healing, as we said, the first is the apoptosis, then the differentiation of keratocyte and the uh, uh, formation of collagen type three and type four. Corneal innervation, uh, I have to say that Dr. Siham, uh, she showed an excellent uh, confocal images of uh, corneal nerve regeneration. Uh, uh, as we know, of course, that the cornea is the most innervated tissue in the body. The sensory innervation of the cornea comes from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The nerves, they enter through the limbus to the anterior stroma where they pass perpendicular to form the subbasal nerve plexus. 70% of the cornea nerves are sensitive to pain, that's nociceptive, and 30% are sensitive to mechanical stimulus. Uh, what's known as the lacrimal functional unit, mainly that's the lacrimal reflex. Uh, uh, the afferent pathway, as we mentioned, is the trigeminal uh, nerve all the way to pons. The efferent pathway are the secretal motor uh, nerves uh, passing through the facial nerve all the way to lacrimal glands. So uh, what's the pathophysiology uh, of the dry eye disease following LVC? Uh, the main cause is iatrogenic corneal nerve damage by photoablation. Uh, it differs if it is a surface laser vision correction or a flat based ablation. For PRK, it directly severes the epithelial subbasal nerve plexus, and to a certain extent, it affects the anterior stromal nerve fibers. This depends on the depth of the ablation. As for the flat based uh, ablation, the LASIK mainly, it directly cuts the corneal nerves, the anterior stroma. 
uh, except at the hinge size, of course, as Dr. Margaret explained with the hinge size uh, and position. Uh, uh, but maybe that's the main reason uh, LASIK in some uh, literature uh, stated to cause more dry eye than the surface LVC. Uh, other factors like the goblet cell damage and uh, the post LVC inflammatory cytokines. This is very important uh, because we have to treat that in the post operative regimen, as we are going to mention. It causes destabilization of tear film. And again, the abnormal ocular surface relation to the uh, lead following ablation. This causes abnormal distribution of tear film over the cornea with blink. Uh, talking about cornea nerve degeneration, usually passed through two phases. The very early phase is eight weeks. Actually, this is not a true uh, cornea nerve degeneration. This is a temporary epithelial subbasal nerve plexus degeneration. This is only to help the epithelial healing. But the actual uh, cornea nerve degeneration starts by the third month. Usually, it's completed for the sub-epithelial uh, layer by 12 months and for the stromal cornea nerves up to three years. Yes, it's up to three years. Uh, so the surface laser vision correction, usually uh, the nerve degeneration is faster than LASIK, uh, depending, of course, uh, on the hinge size and position. The femtolasic, uh, the nerve degeneration is faster than the mechanical LASIK because of the proper opposition of uh, the uh, femto flap, uh, especially with the inverted side cut uh, femto flap, the corneal, the cut, the severe corneal uh, uh, nerve fibers, uh, they are in direct contact with each other, so healing is much faster. And of course, smile gives the best results. So, what we have to do preoperatively uh, if the patient has a dry eye disease, especially if it is inflammatory related, as stated. Uh, we can start with topical corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, and of course, topical lubricant and anesthesia. Uh, during surgery, uh, certain parameters that might affect the degree of dry eye disease, uh, the ablation itself, the depth of the ablation and the width of the ablation. Uh, if it is mechanical removal of epithelium versus trans-epithelial PRK, as mentioned, the trans-epithelial gives faster uh, healing. Uh, the type of contact lens used at the end of surgery, silicon hydrogel, uh, gives better oxygen permeability than the regular ones. And of course, the use of topical corticosteroid and mitomycin C. The use of mitomycin C uh, is very critical in such cases, even though it decreases haze and regression, but it may cause epithelial wound healing delay. And uh, uh, this is a, a big problem if the patient already has a dry eye disease. So the operative diagnosis of dry eye disease is very important. It might change uh, the decision whether to use or not mitomycin C, especially if uh, we are operating with alcohol-assisted PRK. For uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug topical, it, there is controversy uh, uh, about the use of such drugs. Uh, because they may cause some sort of sterile infiltrate, as is shown in this image. And in some cases, uh, and literature reported even uh, corneal milk. For topical corticosteroids, yes, they help with the inflammatory-related uh, dry eye disease, and they decrease uh, the incidence of haze and regression, but again, they do delay epithelial healing, uh, and they cause early epithelial breakdown, that's why uh, many surgeons, they start using corticosteroids after epithelial healing, or when they start, they start with a weaker form of corticosteroids of a surface-acting corticosteroids rather than a strong one. And of course, it may cause steroid-induced glaucoma or uh, the nightmare of every surgeon infectious keratitis. Uh, uh, last but not least, a very important uh, problem which is directly related to dry eye, which is resistant epithelial defect. So talking to, uh, about this problem, we start by the standard usual treatment, the bandage contact lens, preservative free lubricants, the antibiotics and steroids, as we mentioned, we may start uh, on a later stage. Uh, if severe form, we may consider scleral lenses, punctal plugs, autologous sealant, topical cyclosporin, and I've used uh, topical cyclosporin in several cases, and yes, it gives very good results. And uh, the topical regenerative agents like the Cassicole 20, 
Uh, this is a biodegradable nanopolymer. Uh, it, it's like uh, appearance of faith and it improves epithelial healing. And of course, the oxivate, which is a recombinant uh, human nerve growth factor that helps corneal nerve regeneration. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed, and uh, uh, very nice presentation. And we are sorry for it that you have uh, some technical trouble with your presentation, but uh, mm -hmm. thanks God it works nicely. Uh, so we're running out of time. So uh, uh, while I share my screen, uh, there are some questions for Dr. Ahmed. Uh, seems that the audience are uh, more interesting in the monovision that you have done to yourself. So some questions about: uh, Did you use the contact lens trial before uh, going for uh, monovision? Uh, yes, I did try it. I, I tried monovision with contact lens and it worked fine with me, only the contact lens didn't work fine for, for me because I couldn't handle it. Um, I'm, I'm really bad in putting contact lens into my eyes um, and, and it's even worse to get them out. So uh, this was not an option for me. Okay, what about uh, the stereopsis and did the monovision affect your uh, profession like as a surgeon? Yes, it's really astonishing how little uh, I am affected by by the monovision and I have two diopters of anisometropia. This is a lot. Uh, this is not micro monovision. This is full my, uh, monovision. And, and the reason that it works, I think it has to do with the uh, asphericity of the cornea, with the shape. So we have a, uh, my, my reading eye has a very good uh, depth of focus. I can, I can actually see uh, the depth of focus, the difference between the both eyes. And um, so um, what, what, Pseudo accommodation um, for me is that it's kind of neuro pseudo accommodation in my brain, uh, rather inside the eye. Uh, Dan Reinstein has described it very nicely in his talks uh, with with some some didactic uh, photographies, and it, it's exactly right that he was absolutely right about it. It's, it's a neuro pseudo accommodation that works fine with spherical aberrations, and and. Um, what I do at work is that uh, in all my instruments, microscope and, and slit lamp, um, on the left side I have minus two, on the right side is zero. And so it's not, not a problem. I see. So uh, another question about the spherical abrasion, how much spherical abrasion induced after changing the sphericity of the cornea to minus uh, 0 0.6? Um, I, um, I have to go back into the presentation, the higher order. I what I can tell you is the, that the total higher order aberration did not increase so much. I'm yeah. still, let's say, in the norm. It, it's from yeah. 0.2 to max or to 0.4, which is quite, quite nice for a hyperopic treatment. As I remember, it was in the normal range. I didn't yeah. think that's it. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. How do you rate your spectacle independence, reading spectacle independence? 100%? 90%? 100%. Um, I can read uh, little, little readings. I can uh, drive at night. Uh, I can virtually do anything. And I do a lot of uh, um, uh, sports outside, like, like bicycle driving, mountain bike. I do scuba diving. Uh, I do skiing and all, all these things. And for every different sport, I had different glasses. And then sometimes you have to double them because you need sunglasses again. And so now I can do everything, especially um, what I'm very much look, looking forward to is to come to EPEC and, and do the diving in the Red Sea, which I really love to. It's so, so wonderful. And, and I can read my diving computer uh, without glasses, which is great. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Now let me share my screen because uh, we are running out of time. Okay. No, not this one. Okay. Okay. So uh, my talk is uh, regards the modified algorithm for the management of preoperative dry eye or trying to pick those patients of uh, dry eye before commencing cataract surgery. So, as you know, that the impact of uh, ocular surface on cataract and refractive surgery 
is very well addressed in these presentations. Uh, this results in unsatisfactory vision because of the fluctuating of vision, induced higher order aberrations, and may uh, worsen existing ocular surface disorder. And sometimes it acts as a predisposing factor for post-operative uh, endophthalmites. Uh, ACRS has already published a very simplified algorithm for the preoperative diagnosis and treatment of ocular surface disorder. And the aim of this algorithm is trying to limit postponing a plant surgery to only those cases of ocular surface disease that likely to, do, to develop postoperative, uh, bad postoperative outcomes. Uh, this, they are doing so by trying to classify the patients or the candidates for refractive surgery into uh, visually significant ocular surface disorder or non-visually significant ocular surface disorder. So this is the algorithm as you can see in this left side of the screen. It's actually a very nice and simplified algorithm and much more uh, uh, simplified and user intuitive uh, compared to the uh, uh, dry eye disease diagnostic test battery of DUSE 2. However, I had some issues with this applying this algorithm in my practice because the speed to questionnaire didn't work with my patients and I will explain to you here right now. As you can see uh, in, here in, in this geographical area in, some, uh, in, in my region, uh, the patients or most of the patients, not all the patients have misconception that the more you complain, the more you can get attention from the doctor. So they tend to make the questionnaire, they use the highest score everywhere. And you can see this is the left side of the screen. This is the speed uh, test questionnaire by SRS. And you can see one of the forms has already filled by one of the patients. You can see that the patient gave the highest score everywhere. Highest score everywhere making the total score for his dry eye disease 27 out of 28. But after examining the patient and discussing the patient and taking history of the patient, the patient had mild symptoms of dry eye and I did laser for him and he went very well. So making the, this making the uh, speed to a questionnaire less reliable in some cases and in some geographical areas. And the other factors here that so we have some uh, uh, tests missing, like the tear osmolarity test. The tear osmolarity test is not available in my country so far. And sometimes the tests are not are very expensive or a little bit expensive, relatively like the MMP9. So what I'm doing to my patients, it's a modified ACRS algorithm here. I just do their routine assessment for every refractive patient surgery. Uh, every refractive surgery. You can see that I'm doing topography for the patient, aberrometry, tomography, optical biometry, and keratometry. And of course, for the dry eye, I will just stress on the Myers and the K readings, as mentioned before, aberrometry on the cornea and ocular higher order aberrations. Tomography, I'm going to see the K readings and Zernike analysis, have a look on Zernike analysis and checking the cornea and K readings with optical biometry and the K readings with keratometry and trying to compare the K readings with all these devices, if they are going in agreement together or not. If there is no agreement with the K readings with these devices, so most probably this patient has some sort of dry eye. So this is one factor or one clue that uh, may indicate that the patient has dry eye. This is the corneal topography. You can see, of course, as mentioned before, stressing on the uh, Myers, not only the distortion, but the subtle changes that is very useful as uh, screening tool for the patient before commenting refractive surgery. Just uh, you can see that some distortion of the Myers indicates mild form of the dry eye. So then the patient is transferred to the clinic after doing the investigations for the taking history stressing for the dry eye, stressing on seven points, the sense of dryness, gritness, irritation, burning, watering, and eye fatigue and fluctuation of vision, of course. And this, in my mind, this is much more useful than the questionnaire uh, uh, test. And then examination. And of course, I uh, use the LLP uh, P, uh, protocol. The, L, the first L is to look at the lids and lashes. And uh, L, the second L is the lift. 
superior surface to see the superior surface of the cornea and the limbus and pull for the lid laxity and for disease and push for the meibomian gland expression and I stress as well on the blinking of the patient. You can see this patient does not blink and does not close his palpebral fissure completely during the examination and has some sort of lag of thalamus. And of course, this is translated to uh, some sort of dry eye. So this is uh, one of the tests. You can see that I usually, uh, most of the time, amazed by the amount of the toothpaste that comes out of the meibomian gland during meibomian gland expression. I do this routinely, most in my cases, uh, before going for refractive surgery to make sure that the patient does not have some sort of dry eye or posterior blepharitis. Then collecting all the data from the investigation devices and the liver clinical data and the history of the patient and lifestyle and make my decision. And my decision, like the ACRS, is this dry eye. Most of the candidates have some sort of dry eye because of the geographical distribution here, because of the atmospheric factors. Most of the patients have dry eye before cataract, before cataract and refractive surgery, but in variable forms. So I'm just classifying these patients into visually significant dry eye or visually non-significant dry eye. If the, uh, the patient has visually non-significant dry eye, of course, you can schedule for the surgery. If the patient has some sort of visually significant dry eye, I will do, going to do more further investigations like the tear film analysis, MMP9, and vital staining of the cornea. This is an example for the tear film analysis in my office. It's very useful device. It has a very accurate for the uh, break up time, I can check the Myers again, double check the Myers with the topography as well as with the uh, tear film analyzer. You can see here that the, this is break up time, it's less than five seconds. And this is an embalming gland. Like I'm looking for the distortion of the embalming gland and the truncation and atrophy of the embalming gland. And I have as well as an idea about the uh, lipid layer of the tear film. And I have score for each factor here. And of course, we can see here this is the uh, eye blink in better objective way to see if the patient has 100% complete normal blink or some sort of lag of thalamus or incomplete blink. And I have a score here for each factor. You can see here, this is a non-invisible breakup time for the right and the left eye, the eye blink and the lipid layer and the meibomian gland loss in percentage as, as well as the tear high, uh, meniscus height. So this is one more objective test that I assign the patients with visually significant dry eye to go for this test to have a better idea about the ocular surface uh, before going for cataract surgery. And this is the MMP9 test. Now it becomes available in, in, in Egypt. I'm doing the test and then you can have an idea if the patient has a positive MMP9 test, test indicated that this is, there is an inflammatory component of the dry eye. And so we can prescribe some sort of short uh, uh, short course of uh, topical steroids for this patient to treat the dry eye. If the patient has uh, 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 MMP9 less than 14 nanogram per milliliter, uh, so most probably that I will use the, just lubricants, not uh, steroids. And of course, the vital staining, as mentioned before, the fluorescein stain, I don't use the rosbin gas stain, I just use the lysamine green. So if the the patient has two of these tests positive, any two of irregular milestone or elevated higher order ablations, discrepancies between the K readings, low uh, breakup time by tear film analyzer, truncation and atrophy of the meibomian gland, elevated MMP9 or positive vital staining, any two of those I consider this patient have a significant uh, dry eye, visually significant dry eye, and then I will stop going for the surgery, I'll ask the patient to come back again after treating the uh, uh, ocular surface for this patient in particular. My treating, uh, treatment list includes the preservative-free lubricants, uh, gel at that time, short to course of topical steroids, especially if there is elevated MMP9, hot fermentation, so goggles, topical azithromycin, sometimes systemic azithromycin, doxycycline as well, punctal plugs, mechanical uh, blepharo exfoli exfoliation known as blefex and intense pulse light now it's coming on the way 
uh, maybe after two or three months in my clinic and reevaluate the patient after three weeks, sometimes three months before uh, taking the decision for the cataract for the cataract or refractive surgery in this patient. This is another case of uh, uh, treating by uh, mechanical lipho exfoliation. And I'm amazed that most of these patients after treating, after doing this session, that there is improvement in the ocular surface. You can see this patient before and after. You can see this is um, uh, 17th of February, and this is the 2nd of March. And you can see there's improvement in all, all, almost in every aspect. The tear film, meniscus um, high, improved. The meubomian gland lost almost the same, of course, expected, but the lipid layer improved. The eye blink is the same, of course, and the breakup time improved. So this is, in summary, my uh, decision tree. The patient called. I'm, go I'm coming for refractive surgery. Uh, explain to the staff, the staff explain to him that there are some investigations you should do before a, exam, a clinical examination. So it comes to my office doing the necessary investigations and then for the history taking, stressing on the seven points, and then clinical evaluation, including the LLP. And then I decide if the patient has visually non-significant ocular surface disease, of course, exit and go for the surgery. If the patient, if there's irregular Myers or disagreement between the keys and some positive signs for this clinical examination, so you are transferred to the yellow zone. Of course, you should go for the uh, further investigation, the further testing like the tear film analyzer, the MMP9 and vital staining. Any positive, any two positive of the collective tests here, this is considered a visually significant, confirmed visually significant ocular surface disorder. And then I will postpone the surgery for three weeks or three months uh, according to the severity of the cases. And of course, I will prescribe treatment for the patient. If this proved to be negative, so the patient is transferred again to the green zone and go for the uh, uh, refractive surgery. So this is my modified or simplified algorithm based on the algorithm described by the ASCRS in 2019. Uh, so in this way, I think we concluded our session for this uh, webinar. Um, maybe we run out of time. Uh, maybe we'll address the questions later on, uh, on uh, Instagram, on Facebook, on uh, other social media. We'll collect the questions and then we'll answer them day by day. Thank you very much. Any questions for the, for the panel? Thank you. Thank you very much, actually, Ahmed. It was great. Okay. Great job, Thank Ahmed. You Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I know so much work uh, to get something like this running. You really uh, did a great job. Thank you. And excellent talks. I, I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you, much Ahmed. for being Thank you for us. the invitation and for the Thank you. Thank you, Thank nice. you everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Stay safe.